For several of our married couples, they are now about to enter into a very exciting time in this church. They are about to give birth to their first child. It was a little more than eight months ago when myself and Gloria were blessed with the newest member of our family, and that would be our grandson, baby Caleb. After a short period of time, we would ask, who does he look like? Does he look more like his mom or his dad? Because for quite a while, he didn't look like either, and that's typically how it is with many children. But over a period of time, they start to take on the physical characteristics of their parents. And most fascinating, sometimes they take on the mannerisms and they take on some personality traits. And there's very good reason for this because when a child is conceived, they take on the DNA of their parents that is transmitted to them. Chromosomes are passed on to the child and they are infused with the genetics of their parents. This is the case biologically and humanly speaking. This is a fact. But this is also the case spiritually speaking for those who have been born of God. They share the DNA of Jesus Christ. And by implication, they will bear the resemblance of Christ. Now, at this point in the epistle, John would have set the record straight on many things about the true from the false. Who bears the resemblance of Christ? Who is a true converse and who is a false converse? John would make the distinction that a true convert will bear the marks of conversion. Now, John would write about those who walk in the light as opposed to those who walk in darkness. Those who practice righteousness as opposed to those who do not. And those who would do the commandments of God as opposed to those who do not. John will contend that a true convert will bear the marks of conversion and by implication the resemblance to Christ. And one such mark of conversion that we're going to look at today is the mark of love. Now John is known as the apostle of love and some 46 times in this epistle does he mention love in one form or another. 12 times in the six verses that we're going to look at. And he's going to make the statement love one another three times in our text this morning. Now as we look at verses 7 and 8 I want to make this point. Engaging in the practice of loving one another is an exhortation, an indication for those born of God. Let's read verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Now I believe before we can understand the practice of loving one another, we must understand what kind of love we are dealing with here in this passage. Love is such a universal topic, a very complex topic also. Now, all human beings have the capacity to love as we're made in the image of God. We have what's known, we're in the Imago Dei. We share this communicable attribute, theologically speaking. But how do we define love? Well, for example, the American Heritage Dictionary defines love as an intense affection for one another, for another person based on family or personal ties. Now love could be different for different people, but more often than not, love is often equated with emotions. And love can be emotional. There's many who've experienced emotions in the realm of love. And for some, it's been unpleasant. Love has masqueraded itself in such a manner that has actually hurt people and it's not love at all. Love can bring excitement, love can bring joy, and love typically sparks an interest in many people. For example, we look at our culture. Love is the predominant theme in popular music. So many pop songs. You go back in time, about a hundred years, you will see love because it's, love can be experienced. And love is relatable. Love can encompass sentimentality. Love can encompass uh, emotions in films. We see it in novels. 
And the word love is misunderstood. It's often thrown around aimlessly. Humanity's concept of love can change. You see, people fall in and out of love constantly. Divorce rates are soaring. If you were to ask the vast majority of people, I believe, when you walk down that aisle, did you love your spouse? I would say many of them, at least the vast majority, would say, yes, I did. What happened? Love changed, supposedly. Mankind's love for one another is inconsistent. It's up, it's down. Because mankind's love is usually conditional. It's usually self-serving, humanly speaking. Now, biblical love, as we're looking at in our passage, it has its complexities as well. In the New Testament, we see primarily four types of words that connote four types of love. We see eros, the first one. That indicates a romantic or sexual union between a husband and a wife. Phileo connotes brotherly love used to refer to a friendship. We see storge, used for a family love, the love a parent has for a child. But in our text today, this word that we're looking at is called agape. This word is agape love, and it's not motivated by feelings or sentimental love. It's volitional. It is a love of choice. Agape love is a self-sacrificial love. And when it comes to agape love, it's true that you could say that actions truly do speak louder than words. And in our passage today, John is addressing these people that are the beloved. The beloved here. Let us love one another. Who are these people? Well, these are friends of God. They are dearly loved by God, by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. They are loved with an eternal love. Those who possess this love are called to share this love with others who possess the same love, who are loved by God as well. Now the verb here is in the present tense, and it indicates that there should be a consistency about this. We should be involved in the practice. It leads me to ask this question. Does God love all of humanity the same? Is there a one size that fits all? I think the Bible distinguishes God's love for humanity a little different than he does for his beloved, for his elect. For example, his love for humanity can consist of what Matthew 5 45 speaks of. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And in some cases, these very same people, as Psalm 5.5 5 says, he hates those workers of iniquity as well. And God is tolerant with those workers of iniquity and does not destroy them immediately. But God has a special love for his beloved, his e elect, Consider the Old Testament for a minute. We see God's electing love in Amos 3.2. Yahweh speaking through the prophet Amos to the sons of Israel, whom he brought up from the land of Egypt. And verse 2 states, You only have I chosen among the families of the earth. This word for chosen in the ESV is no. You only have I intimately known. We do see a distinction between God's beloved and humanity. And those who are beloved of God are born of God. Those who are beloved of God know God intimately. And by implication, those who are born of God will love his people and ought to love his people. Why? We possess this love. We become partakers of God's divine nature. 2 Peter 1.4 To be born of God is to know God, not some theories about God. We don't have concepts about God. We have God in us. The spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in us. 
Romans 8, 11. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, 5. We have God. A sober reflection of this should cause us to react several ways. I mean, we could raise our hands in the air and say, thank you, Lord. We can get on our knees and praise. We can go and share this love, share the good news with people. But what John is saying here, what we are called to do is to love one another. Those born of God have received the love, should give the love. It's love recycles love. It reproduces. And this is our mandate. And in verse 8, John makes the contrast opposed to those who don't. Now in verse 8, John is alluding to those who had a form of spirituality. They had an ethereal mysticism, a dry, cold head knowledge. It was personal. It wasn't relational. And what it was called, it was in its embryonic stages of what would be Gnosticism. Now what is Gnosticism and a bit of Doicism, not to get too technical, but these teachings blended Greek dualism with Eastern mysticism. And they adopted a view that anything non-material, anything or spirit was good, and anything material was evil. Now this was a form of spirituality that was barren of one essential aspect. It was barren of love. They had a Christ, they professed the Christ, but this was no Christ at all. This was a counterfeit Christ, and these were counterfeit Christians as well. The difference between the authentic and the counterfeit will be evident. As John is making the, 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 the statements throughout the epistle, the difference will be tangible in practice, and over time, truth will come to the surface. And he says it very well in 1 John 3.10. How do we know who's who? By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So love is an exhortation for us to do, but it's an indication as well. These false teachers were loveless and they were godless. Why? The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now let's look at this phrase, God is love. Is God only love on Sunday and Tuesday he's just, and Wednesday he's righteous and he's holy on... Th no, God is all these things together. But we must understand his love in relation to all his other attributes. For instance, God's love is a holy love. God's love is an eternal love. God's love is an infinite love, as God is like himself. God is not dependent on anything. It's part of his, what theologians call, his aseity. And his love, we can't do anything to merit it. We can't affect it as well. God's love is out of, out of time and space, as God is transcended. And so is his love. And it's also a Trinitarian love. Consider what Dr. R.C. Sproul wrote. This love is an intertrinitarian love. We are the friends of God by virtue of the intra-trinitarian love of God that so worked out in the fullness of time that the plan of redemption conceived in the mind of God in eternity past has exploded into our space-time history at exactly the right moment. When the fullness of time had come, as Paul puts it, God sent forth his Son. And that leads us to verses 9 and 10, which I want to make this point. God's love was revealed and exemplified in Jesus Christ. We are to follow Christ's example by loving one another self-sacrificially. Christ is our example to follow. Let me read the verses for you. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son in the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Christ came to earth self-sacrificially to lay down his life. He left the eternal love of the Father and the Spirit. And he is the source of all love. Not only the originator of all love, but he is the initiator. He is the initiator for the love of mankind and the love of his elect. We do not love, we cannot love God. God has to be the initiator. And he loved us in obedience to the Father, this is Christ, and he laid down his life and bore the burden of our sin to make propitiation. And what this word means is it's appeasement. He appeased the wrath of God that was upon us. He appeased the Father, for it pleased the Father to bruise him in Isaiah. God loves us, but we must remember that his, He loves us in the Son. He loves us in Christ. The love of God is revealed in Christ, and Christ is the supreme model of self-sacrificial love and our example, so that we may manifest Christ. Christ was manifested to us and in us, and now we are called to manifest it as well. But this can be challenging. We know the scriptural commands that are in the Bible. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. We're even told to love our enemies. As challenging as that is, it could also be challenging to love the brethren for various reasons. Now, though it's a command in scripture, it's a challenging command. Why is that? Because people could be difficult. We're all re in rehabilitation with sinners that are being rehabilita rehabilitated. Now, for some, it's easier than others, and personality comes into play. I understand that. But many would ask this question. If I was to ask you, would you rather love God and love his people second? Love God first, love his people second. Or I just want to love God. Many will say in churches in America, I love God my own way. You love God, brethren, by loving his people. That's an aspect of our love for God. They are synonymous. Where do I get this from? 1 John 4.21. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Now, it's challenging, I do know, and there are many different churches out there, many different denominations, and quite frankly, we do this well, and I'm grateful to say that. But I want to grow in this. I need to grow in this. We all must grow in the love for one another. You know, we were thinking of changing the name of, of this church. It's Tottenville Evangelical Free Church. We call it TEFC. We were thinking, it's not official yet, we were thinking of calling it S-U-G-R, Sinners Under God's Renovation. You can use that for any church that is preaching the truth and sanctification is going on. We are under renovation, folks. We are under constructions. Some of us struggle because in the past we've been hurt. We've been extended ourselves and there's been a vulnerability when you love. There's an emotional recall of some past hurts. There was no reciprocation. So I'm not going to love. I'm not going to extend my hand again. Sometimes God will allow you to go through this. You know why? What was the opening scripture we looked at? Several things will happen in our life to teach us about the New Testament this depiction of love. The self-sacrificial love. Consider 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. So, see the example of Christ? But there's other reasons. You know, we can't love everyone like we want to. There's just not enough time. Investing in people is time consuming. And we always fall back on our self-centeredness at times. It's the flesh, folks. 
We have a battle between the flesh and the spirit. If you don't know that, if you're new in the faith, you'll realize that soon. Our flesh is not inclined to love others, but it's inclined to love self. This kind of love does what's best for the other person. And I'm convinced the more time we spend in the presence of God, in His Word, the more we grow like Him. It's like water to a plant. Over time, the water blossoms and the plant grows. It's like the fruits of the Spirit. We abide in Christ. We will bear fruit. But this congregation does this well, brethren. Praise God for this. But I want to grow in it again. So how do we do this? What does this truly encompass? Well, just as we saw last week, as monogism, we looked at as our regeneration was of God alone. The love you have is of God alone. You can't do anything to learn it or to gain any, any of it. The love is of God alone. But I believe as sanctification is cooperative and synergistic, so is this process. It's God who works in you, but yet we're called and exhorted and commanded to do this practice of loving one another. Remember, this is an agape love. This love that we have, this fruit of the Spirit, is to be practiced. And John gives an example of how we can do this in 1 John 3, 16 to 18. No, we'll take it from 17 to 18. 1 John 3, 17 to 18. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against them, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed in truth. I believe when we are living in the power of Christ, it's easier to recognize these things. These things. It's easier to practice this love. Think about the cross daily. You want to excel in love? You want to grow in love? Think about your own unworthiness. And think about Christ's propitiation for us. In verse 10, we see, In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son. God is the source, like we said. He's not only the originator of love, He's the initiator. Now, it's the cross that satisfied the wrath of God. An example of the self-sacrificial love. I have to think about this daily. The gospel is not something that we were told at one point. We have to preach the gospel to ourselves daily. We have to think about the gospel daily. And when you do that daily, your mind changes, your heart changes, your priorities changes. Your whole outlook on life will change. Now the third point I want to make in verses 11 to 12. God's love in us is perfected in the practice of loving one another. And in doing so, Christ is not only manifested, he's evident. He's evident. The third time John will make this statement to love one another. In verse 12, John writes, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another... God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Christ is seen. Christ is made visible when we are active in this love. We manifest Christ, loving each other demonstratively. When the love abides in us, it translates into the primary purpose in us, and God's will is fulfilled. Do you realize it is the will of God, the prescriptive will of God, the known will of God, that we love one another? We grow in maturity when we practice this love. This is pleasing to Christ and Christ is seen. Think about the words of Jesus in John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love 
for one another. Brethren, Christians are called to do certain things. We're called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. There are things we're called not to love. John would write, love not the world, nor the things in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We're not to love things God hates. There's a time under the sun for us to practice our Christianity. There's a place for polemics. There's a place for apologetics. There's a place for evangelism. But whatever we do, may it be done with the resemblance of Christ. May it all be done in love. Are we fulfilling this calling in here? Are we fulfilling the calling in the church and outside? One of the greatest ways the world can see Christ is through us and it's through our love. Beyond loving one another. Loving those who are at enmity with God. The love that has been given to us is to be shared. It's been poured out into us so that we give it away. May we be a people known for love. May we be a people who are living in the power of Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and loving all people, and certainly loving Christ's people. May we pour out what we've been given. May we grow in grace and grow in the practice of this love. Giving love and receiving love as well. As I conclude, I want to tell you one of the prerequisites. Perhaps you're not part of this love. You're not partaking in it. One of the prerequisites in partaking in today's theme is this. In order to give this love, you have to possess this love. In order to possess this love, you have to receive this love. John would write in his gospel probably a year before this letter, in 1 John 12 and 13, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. This is God's divine love. This is his supernatural love and eternal love. It's secure. It's not superficial. It's not passing. And nothing can separate you from this great love. And it's a love that never fails. Perhaps you're curious about this love. And perhaps you're someone who knows that you need this love. Perhaps you're someone who likes a good love story. The greatest love story ever written is found in this book. And you can call this the story of redemption. And in this story, an innocent man was sentenced to death, a death he freely accepted. He did this because he was sent on a mission from his father to pay a ransom to an undeserving and guilty people. The innocent man, though, he loved these guilty people. And he expressed it by dying for them. By doing so, he would pay the ransom of all that the Father would give them. All that would accept his love would be declared not guilty. Do you realize if you have not accepted this love that you are guilty? And a ransom needs to be paid. You can't pay this for yourself. You do not have what it takes. You could be a millionaire, a billionaire. You still cannot pay this ransom. Receive God's gift of salvation. This free gift. How do you do it? You place your trust. You place your confidence. In the one and only Jesus Christ. By grace through faith alone. Not in any religion, not in any person other than Christ Jesus alone. It was about 19 years ago when I received this love. I remember a lot of things about that season in my life. And I remember I came to terms with my guilt. I needed this. I came to terms with the fact that I was a sinner. What I thought was no big deal 
was going to kill me. 19 years ago, I received this love and my life changed forever. And I'm growing ever since in this love. And I'm discovering more about this love. Brethren, receive this love if you have not. Walk in this love, brethren, if you're not walking in it. My friend, if you've not received Jesus Christ's love, there is no greater love. Come to the cross today and receive the gift of eternal life. Let us pray. Father God, we give thanks, Lord. We give thanks for your great love. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. And whosoever, whosoever will believe in Jesus Christ shall be granted eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for those that have received this love, that nothing can separate us from this love. And Father, we ask in the power of the Holy Spirit that you do a work in our hearts. And may we be a people known for many things, but may we bear the resemblance of Jesus Christ. May we be a people of love. And may it start first here in the household of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.